Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In this video, I want to compute the simplest non-trivial example of a fundamental group and show how it implies the fundamental theorem of algebra. Okay, so the simplest non-trivial example of a fundamental group and a very important one is the fundamental group of the circle S1. Okay, so we're going to compute pi 1 S1 and what's the way that we are going to do this? So the way that we'll do this is by looking at a cover, in fact, the, what's called the simply connected cover. Okay, so here's S1, and I can think of this S1, in my circle S1 here, I can think of this as R modulo Z. Okay, so of course there's a natural quotient map from R to R mod Z, and this is a cover, as we have seen. So uh, we can write the cover as like a projection down like this, uh, if we view this R as a spiral like this. Okay, so that's all very well and good. When we talk about fundamental groups, normally we have a base point. Okay, so let's just pick one point here which corresponds to zero. Okay, the image of zero, of course, is just uh, zero plus Z. Um, so there's a point here. And we're looking at the inverse image of that. So that's just going to be all the integers. So pi inverse of P is equal to Z. So remember, there's a Galois action of this fundamental group on this cover and I'll remind you what that is in a little while uh, but let's just uh, see what we have here so the point is that in particular since it acts on the cover and in particular it acts fiber wise so this pi 1 s1 will act on this fiber z okay and you can say also uh, some things about it so firstly the action is transitive so that means that uh, this is a single orbit so it's going to be some quotient of pi 1 s1 by the stabilized subgroup, and the stabilized subgroup is going to be the image of the fundamental group upstairs. Now, what's happening upstairs? You have R, which is a contractible topological space. So that means it's homotopically trivial, so its fundamental group has to be trivial as well. So this pi 1 of R is just uh, the identity inside here. So in fact, this quotient is just pi 1 of S1. So as a set, at least we know that this pi 1 s1 is just equal to z. And in fact, this is true as pi 1 uh, s1 set. Okay, so with the pi 1 s1 action. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves how this uh, correspondence kind of works. Okay, so let's pick an equivalence class of a loop inside here. So let's just pick an, act, um, an actual loop. So let's suppose we have this black loop that we have here running around like that. Uh, how does this act on, for example, this zero, this element of this uh, fiber here? Well, what do we do? All we need to do is we lift this path from zero up to this R. So we need to lift it, so it has to be a map from zero, one to here, which starts at this zero. Okay, so how does it act on zero? And then it has to be when you compose it, you get this loop. So of course you have to go around like this. until you go get to one, okay? So that tells you that um, what does this uh, loop correspond to inside here? It corresponds to one. So you can see how this loop acts on any point in the inverse image of this P, so on any integer. And I hope you can see what it does, of course, uh, uh, as we've seen many times in this playlist, what it does is basically spiral you up one rung. Okay, so another way to say it is that it moves you from one deck to the next one up, hence a deck transformation. Okay, so it just slides you up one like that. So as you can see, uh, if you look at this loop here, firstly, if you look at the group generated by it, okay, it uh, certainly acts. Uh, it generates the cyclic group, okay, the infinite cyclic group, okay, because uh, each time you act with this, you just move up one. And it also acts transitively. So, in fact, what we will see is that the fundamental group, pi 1 of S1, is freely generated by this group, okay. So, this is going to be a cyclic, uh, infinite cyclic group that this generates. And of course, since you get all whole fiber that way, it has to be the um, 
all of this pi 1 s1. Okay, so pi 1 s1 is isomorphic to z as a group. Okay, so that's a wonderful um, result. And not only is it interesting in its own right, okay, but we're going to use it to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra as well. Okay, and this is the classical way actually to compute uh, fundamental groups. Okay, so you use a color and this Galois action. Okay, so you all know what the fundamental theorem of algebra is. Let's just uh, state it in the form that we want here. So suppose we have some complex polynomial with say variable z. Um, let's suppose the degree is given by d. And of course, we want to look at the case where this d is positive. Okay, so in that case, if we, we want to say that in that case, it has a complex root. And um, in our case, what we'll do is we'll call this complex polynomial p of z. And you might as well scale it so that the leading coefficient is 1. So that's what we've done here. Okay, so we want to prove this using the fundamental um, group of S1. So we want to bring in some loops somewhere. Okay, so where are those loops going to come? Um, also very important here is the fact that we're working in the homotopy category. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, and this is one of the key points of what's happening, is we want to sort of morph this uh, polynomial. So that's some type of a homotopy. So what's that? So the hop and toppy uh, variable here will be s, it will go from 0 to 1. And rather than just looking this, uh, at this polynomial p of z by itself, we're going to look at a whole family of polynomials. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll keep that first term here, that leading term here, z to the d. But the rest of the polynomial, we're going to scale by a factor of s. And that s will vary from 0 to 1. So when s equals 1, we recover the original polynomial. But when s equals 0, okay, we just get uh, p0 of z is equal to z to the d, and that's a very easy polynomial to understand. Okay. And where are we going to get our loops? Okay, so we want our loops uh, to be inside c minus 0. Okay. So the key point here is that um, if you look at c minus 0, uh, that is homotopic to the circle. Okay, you can contract it to the circle, and so the, the homotopy, the, or rather the fundamental groups of c minus 0 and s1 are the same. Okay, so this is the key point. Okay, we're going to look at loops inside c minus 0. Okay, that's homotopy equivalent to the circle. And we know what the fundamental group of that is. That's going to be z. Okay, and we know what the, um, the uh, elements of this fundamental group are as well. Okay, so what are the loops inside c minus 0 that we want to look at? So basically, they're going to be functions um, from 0, 1 into c minus 0. And uh, we'll look at a whole family of loops, the one for each value of s. I'll call it gamma s, and it just sends t to p s of r e to the 2 pi i t, okay, and where this r uh, is going to be some fixed large positive real that I'm going to specify later, okay, and we just need to make sure that this r is big enough, okay, uh, any sufficiently big r will do. So let's just try to understand what this loop is, okay? And the way I'll do it is that, well, this is kind of a function of functions, so I'll break it up that way. So firstly, we have the unit interval 0, 1. And what I'll do first is I'll do the first inside function here. I'll map it to r e to the 2 pi i t, okay? So of course, the image here will land inside uh, the modulus of this exponential term here, of course, is 1. So the modulus of this whole thing is r, so you lie on the circle of radius r, all those complex numbers of modulus r, and basically uh, what this first part will do, the map t to this uh, r e to the 2 pi i t, just goes around this circle of radius r like that. And now what do you do? Well, I guess it depends on what your s is. So let's look at some uh, various possibilities for what s can be. So let's do the simple case where s equals 0. So we'll do now p0. And what happens there? p0 is just set to the d. 
So we just take any point here and we just raise it to the power of d. So what does that mean? Well, that means that you raise the modulus to the power of d, so you're now on a circle that's of a radius r to the d, and you multiply the argument by d as well. So that means that the loop that you have here, right, this single loop around this, will now go to a loop that's on the circle of radius r to the d, but since the argument gets multiplied by d as well, you go around d times. So let me just draw the case d equals 2. Okay. okay, so this is D equals 2 case. Okay, so that's what P0 does. Okay, and certainly this lies inside C minus 0. Okay, so let's see what happens if you have some other S, and in particular um, S equals 1. Okay, we'll have a look and see what happens in that case here. Maybe I'll do it in a different color. Maybe P1, or any S, in fact, uh, will look more or less similar to this. Now we have to add in this extra bit here. And this is where we now pick the choice of the R. Okay? So this set to the D, and the key point here is that this is the dominant term. So if you pick the R to be sufficiently large, of course, the modulus is, of this is R to the D. The modulus of z to the d minus 1 is r to the d minus 1, and then all the other powers will be smaller uh, moduli, as long as r is, of course, bigger than 1. And so you can pick r to be so big that the modulus of this bit here is always strictly smaller than the modulus of the term coming from here. So that means that when you look at this loop, okay, if you look at the corresponding point here and see where it goes to, okay, maybe... On the map P0, it would go to where well, you multiply the argument by D or end, end up something here. But now you have to add a term. But that term that you add is smaller than the modulus of this, uh, or the radius of the circle. So you'll never hit the zero. Okay? And so in particular, it will land inside C minus zero. And the usual way you picture it is that you make this to be such a dominant term that this is basically just a minor perturbation of what you see here. So the way you should think of it is that, well, it's somewhat similar to, and you just go around sort of twice as well, but uh, like that. Okay. So the key point is you pick R big enough so that the modulus of this part here, or any of the S's up to one, okay, is strictly smaller than the modulus of this here, which is R to the D. And that'll make sure uh, that you're, you land inside C minus zero. Okay, okay so uh, what's the point? So we've got some loops inside C minus zero, right? So let's have a look at those loops inside C minus zero. So the first one is gamma zero. Okay, so the gamma zero is basically you just wind around D times. Okay, so that's in C minus zero. So if you use the contraction and you use the homotopy equivalence with a uh, circle, of course, you can see what does it correspond to. If you just wind around D times, that should correspond to D. Okay. So this will correspond to D inside Z. Okay, but now let's uh, slowly uh, deform this S parameter from zero up to one. You can see that that's a homotopy of loops. And so gamma 1 is homotopy equivalent to gamma 0. So that means it corresponds to the same element inside this fundamental group, uh, which is given by D inside Z. Okay, so in particular, it's non-trivial. It's not 0 inside Z. Okay? Uh, so um, that's rather nice that we have a loop here, and we can say what element of the fundamental group it corresponds to. Okay. Uh, so where am I going to get my contradiction? I want to do this as a proof by contradiction. So let's assume now that this has no complex roots. This poly polynomial has no complex roots. Okay, so we haven't um, uh, done anything at the moment other than to look at some loops. Okay, and the contradiction I want to give you now is that this gamma one is actually homotopically trivial if we assume that this has no roots. And since it's homotopically trivial, it will correspond to zero. And remember, D was positive. Okay. 
So why is this homotopically trivial? Okay, so now I need another homotopy of this gamma one, uh, uh, which is a map from here to here, a loop inside here, but uh, in particular a map from zero one to here. And what I'm going to do now is rather than varying this second part of the map, I'm going to vary the first part of the map, and I'm still going to use P1. Okay, so I'll just do a homotopy from here to here, okay, and then vary it. So what's the homotopy? Okay, so the first one, of course, is going to be uh, the map. I start with this map, just go around the circle. And now I want to change it slightly. So how do I want to change it slightly? What I'll do is that I move inside slightly, and then I go around like this. And then as I increase the parameter that I deform by, I can go in by more, and then I go in like this. Right? And each time I'm going to compose over here. Okay? So that will slightly change it. And one of the things that you note here is that um, as you uh, look at all these loops, well, where do they land? Okay? Remember, we're applying P1 to some uh, complex numbers here, and P1 was this polynomial, and we're assuming that it has no complex roots, so you never land in zero. Okay, so that's where we use uh, this hypothesis, um, we're assuming the contradiction that it has no complex um, roots. Okay, so uh, that will give you a homotopy inside C minus zero. And let's see what happens when you keep shrinking it. At the end of the day, you'll get a loop which goes like this from here to zero. You make it really small, right? You go like this, so you go to zero and back. And well, what is that loop there? So basically, what happens is that you will just look at the image of this path here, right? So there's an image of the path. Maybe we'll copy, we'll put it in a different color. Um, put it in black. You have an image of the path. Okay, and then you retrace back. And of course, since you have an image of the path and you just trace back, this is clearly homotopically trivial. And so that's going to give you the fact that this gamma one should correspond to zero inside Z. And that uh, gives you the contradiction that proves the fundamental theorem of algebra. Hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.